Good morning, everyone. Uh, so yeah, my name is, is Roderick. I'm a co-founder at Amber Video. Uh, and I spent the last two and a half years looking at fake video and fake audio, uh, specifically machine-generated fakes. And today I want to talk to you guys about one of the, a type of machine-generated fake video, deep fakes. So is now the time to solve the deep fake threat? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes is the correct answer. Uh, all right, you've been great. Thanks. <laughs> so why this sense of urgency? Why, why are we addressing this now? Or why am I talking about this now? And what can we do? What tech can we use to try and combat some of that? I'll, I'll take you through some of what we experimented with and, and discovered over the past couple of years. And also show you how some of that can be applied by looking at a practical application. Uh, so to start with, deep fakes. What are they? Um, I'm sure many of you have seen a lot of these deep fakes already online. But for those who, who may not be aware, it's the use of machine learning, uh, deep neural networks to synthesize fake imagery uh, with neural networks trained on the visual appearance of people. Uh, so here's one I prepared earlier. Hello, Dmux. This is Do we have sound? coming to you from the airport. Uh, it's not actually Keanu Reeves. This is Rod here, uh, demoing while I'm waiting for my flight. So there we go. It's, I'll grant you it's not the best deep fake. If you've seen some other ones, they're probably a little bit more convincing. Um, but the point of this one is that I was able to put it together in about 30 minutes while I was waiting for my flight at, at the gate. Uh, this was in, in Hong Kong. Uh, I flew from Hong Kong to here over the weekend. And I was waiting for, for a while at my gate and created this, this video. Um, I downloaded some free open source software, the latest version of the, the uh, Facebook open source software. I used uh, footage for, of Keanu Reeves I found online, and I put it all on a uh, cloud computing instance that I was able to run for free because I had some, some free credits. Uh, thanks, Google. I know you're here. Um, so uh, yeah, the total cost for me was $0 and about 30 minutes of my time. Uh, obviously, the instance was running for about 24 hours, but that was, that was happening behind the scenes. So that's one of the big changes that are, that are sort of driving this, this concern is that it's getting better and it's getting cheaper. The GPUs are getting cheaper, the software is getting better. It's increasingly automated as well. What you saw there is the raw output of the algorithm. I didn't load it up in a video editor, change some levels, um, you know, blur the edges of, of the, the splicing of the fake face into, into the real video. Didn't have to do anything. That's just the raw output. And it's, again, that automation, that unsupervised nature of, of these deep fakes is, is getting better and better. And finally, distribution. Um, you know, thanks to, to social media, we can, we can send out these, uh, this content in a way that's global, that's instant, and that's, that's micro-targeted. Uh, so what are the implications? Uh, well, deep fakes, at the end of the day, they're, they're a tool. And like any tool, uh, they can be used for, for good and evil. I've, I've just realized this is a terrible illustration to point out tools can be used for good or evil. The Death Star is definitely <laughs> not morally neutral. It, is, it, is, it can only be used for, for evil. Um, yeah, a planet destroyer cannot be used for, for good. But deep fakes can. Um, we can. We can think of deep fakes as, as being uh, a really interesting tool for us to, to make creative content, to, to delight audiences, to, to do all sorts of interesting stuff. Uh, and to illustrate this, this, you might have seen this if you watched uh, Star Wars Rogue One, uh, where um, Grand Moff Tor uh, Torkin, who uh, is played by, um, oh, I've forgotten, Peter Cushing. Um, Peter Cushing obviously passed away a while ago. But here he's playing, he's playing a character from beyond the grave. And he looks, he looks no different from any other actor, right? That's the point. You can't tell. Uh, now, obviously, this isn't 
actually, this isn't a deep fake. Uh, this was this was special effect. But that shows you one of the applications of this type of technology and, and how we can, you know, do very interesting things with it. But it can also be used for evil. And there's different ways it can be used for evil, different, different applications. There's two I want to focus on in particular, and you'll, you'll see why. Uh, the first is disinformation. Um, now, I don't know if you, some of you might recognize that, that image on the top left. Um, Jordan Peele, who's a stand-up comedian, well, a, a sketch show comedian and also a film director, uh, worked with BuzzFeed to create a demo deepfake. Uh, he impersonates former President Barack Obama uh, as part of some of the sketch shows he does. So he did a voiceover of uh, you know, so-called Barack Obama uh, insulting the, the current president. And he did this. Uh, he, he worked with BuzzFeed to then get them to do a deepfake synthesis of, of the former president. So the end result was the appearance of Barack Obama saying things that you know, he really probably shouldn't. Of course, they, they were doing this to highlight the problem, but this definitely could happen. Uh, we can imagine political, uh, political campaigns micro-targeting certain groups of people that are, that are on the fence and, and appealing to, using an appeal to authority by getting someone they trust to say something, even though they would never say it, and just enough to shift public perception and, and cause sort of a, a knock-on effect. And so he who controls the best deepfake technology controls society, in a way. Uh, the same with, it doesn't have to be politics. It can be, you can imagine the CEO of a big multinational corporation waking up and finding his or her likeness all over the internet with, uh, you know, saying something terribly uh, racist, say. They never said this, of course. It was maybe one of their competitors who, who created that, that footage, or, or maybe even a state actor. And the idea here is, yeah, he who controls the best defects and controls the economy. Um, so yeah, no, no biggie, I guess. Uh, but then there's another application which is not really talked about so much in the press and maybe has a more immediate concern, which is the falsification of evidence. Uh, we, we know that Body one camera footage, CCTV camera footage, citizen journalis journalism footage can often be used in, in court cases, for example. And what happens then when someone is sentenced to maybe life in prison based on some footage that shows them doing something when, when actually they were never there? The CCTV footage hasn't been faked. Or maybe, you know, flip it the other way around. Could someone get acquitted? now for something they, a crime they committed by saying, hey, you know, deep fakes exist. That looks like me. How do you know? How do you know that's me? And we don't. That's, uh, that's the problem. So, but the key thing is with, with both these examples, we're talking about videos of criticality. We're not looking at, uh, well, all, all the, if you think of all the videos that are shared on, online through broadcast, everywhere, the, the majority probably isn't at risk of deep fakes. There's, you know, all the video that's there to entertain, to, to, um, uh, the, for, for humor, that's not necessarily an issue. We're not really, I guess I'm not worried about the deep fake of someone, you know, faking their, their dog skateboarding or something like that. Uh, where it is concerning is these videos of criticality where someone's making, making a decision uh, and it could be a matter of life and death, right? Like in the previous example. It could be military intelligence. It could be, there could be wars coming out of, of these critical videos. And so what I really want to do is focus, focus on those. And forget for a moment the, 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 the levity side, the you know, people creating fakes for, for a joke. So what, what can we do about it? So the, uh, there's several solutions we can think of to, to combat deep fakes. I put them in two broad categories. There's one which is detecting when fakes, uh, when fakes are, uh, when, when you, they're already online, they're already being distributed, and, and you know they're out there, and you're trying, trying to find them, trying to find if a video is fake or not. And then on the other side, 
there's the idea of authentic authenticating video from the moment it's created so that when you watch it, you know that it hasn't been faked along the distribution chain. You know, if you think about the, the example of the court case, you've got, would you prefer to know that there's an 80% chance or 70% chance that the video is faked? Or would you like sort of a, a green tick to say, hey, this is, this is authentic, 100%. Um, and so, so that's, those are the kind of the two approaches I'd like to talk about. So talking about detecting deep fakes for, for a second. Uh, so we know that deep fakes are synthesizing, it's AI synthesizing new content, uh, building, building content with various building blocks, and they're leaving behind uh, artifacts, patterns that we can try and detect. And there's different ways we can do that. Uh, well, one thing we experimented with was training an AI on, um, on the deep fakes. So uh, if, if you're familiar with sort of image classification using neural networks, uh, we, we used uh, a, uh, an existing model uh, for, for classification called, called ResNet, which is used quite often for saying, you know, this is a car, this is a dog, this is a person. And then we gave it some extra training material and saying, this is a real person, and this is a faked person, and had a look at, at what the outcome of that was. Uh, of course, to do that, you need to give it a lot of training material. You need to give it a lot of deep fakes. And the problem is, there, right now, there aren't really enough out there. Um, you know, like I was saying with the, those three points, that immediacy, we're, we're kind of at the tipping point. Uh, we're, we're, we're almost there. And they're, you know, they're coming. They're, uh, those deep fakes, they're, they're, they're just north of the wall, right? We, we just, they're coming. Um, but we don't have them yet. So... What we did is we generated a whole bunch of fakes, fake videos, and, and trained an AI on, AI on that. Uh, so, you know, that, that has some problems of its own, and we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. What else can we, can we do? Well, it's pretty, um, this isn't a, a new idea, detecting splicing in general. So, so forget the, the sort of neural networks for a moment. We can detect when there's uh, content that's been copied into an existing video using a whole bunch of different, different algorithms. It's a, a pretty, uh, pretty advanced area of research. There's been quite a lot of really interesting uh, developments in, in the last few years, actually, in, in this area. Uh, some of the things we were looking at was, was modeling ca uh, camera-specific uh, signatures and anomalies and, and seeing sort of discrepancies in, in the... Uh, um, in the, what's it called, the, the color filter array, um, and how that gets you know, translated to 42 lines and, and you know, discrepancies there and misalignments there. Uh, but also detecting anomalies in, in the frame residuals, that's, that's one of the other approaches, so that's kind of what you're visualizing here, uh, where you're looking at the, uh, the gradients of, of the, you know, the co-location of, of the residuals in, in your encoded data and looking for sudden, sudden jumps, sudden anomalies in, in that gradient, especially if it's on sort of the x and y axis like it is there. That's a, a, you know, um, that's a good sign of the, the, the sort of algorithms that are in use today. Uh, the other thing we can look at is we're talking about the, the automation of deep fakes and that they're, they're more, they use more and more advanced ways of, of merging and, and uh, sort of smoothing the effects of introducing a, a synthetic image into your existing content. And so we can look at things like uh, the blur function that, that they apply. We know the blur function that all of these al existing algorithms apply. We can try and detect that. We can look at uh, the, uh, the color matching. Like if, if we know the hue is the same from one pixel to the other, but everything else is changing, and that's happening on, on sort of, you know, uh, interesting uh, axes, like along the X or Y axes in, in nice straight lines, and we know, oh, there's something going on there. So we can, we can do that kind of detection. But fundamentally, we've seen with all the, these experiments that we've done that, that there are some, some sort of systemic challenges. Um, when we're talking about automated deep fakes, we can detect some of the, the patterns I was mentioning before, but as soon as you do any sort of post-processing and, and any sort of professionally created deep fake where, where they're, they're tweaking and they're, they're, they're altering the, um, the, the final, final output, a lot of that kind of flies out the window. 
And so the, the algorithms we trained on the, on the direct output didn't really hold up with, with that Jordan Peele, Barack Obama example. Um, also transcoding, we found that if we upload the videos onto social media, download them again, upload them again, download them, and try our AI classifier, it often told us, oh, that looks like a deep fake to me, uh, which is weird. I mean, it's a, I guess it's a false positive. Or, or maybe it isn't. I don't, I don't know what you guys are doing to, to my poor videos. But. Um, and then the most important one is the idea that you know, this is an arms race at the end of the day. If you've got two AIs fighting each other, they're going to learn from, from each other. They, the one that's creating the fake is going to see, OK, that didn't fool this deep fake prevention algorithm. I'm going to learn from that. And so there's always going to be that, you know, it's a never-ending uh, cycle. And um, it's, it's, you know, I'm not saying detection doesn't have its place and it can be a really useful tool. But we were thinking, how can we, how can we do something a little bit stronger? How can we create a trust layer? Something a little bit like TLS, um, how we, we're, we're, we trust the, the little green padlock on, on a website. How can we do something like that, but for video? Uh, and I, I like TLS as an analogy here because you know you might not need to rely, um, you might not want HTTPS when you're visiting uh, the website of your favorite restaurant, but you definitely want it when you're doing your online banking. And so it's the same sort of idea. Not every video needs to have sort of a, a green tick uh, saying, "Hey, this hasn't been altered." But for the ones who, that matter, the ones in court, the ones that, that have a political consequence, you definitely do. So how can we do that? Well, we can think of existing approaches to, um, to securing files, uh, which is you, know, you take the file, hash it, apply a hash function on the file, store it somewhere, like a, like a blockchain ledger, where you know, it's, it's immutable and everyone can access it. And then when someone consumes the, the file, they, they download the hash, and they compare the hash. And if someone's altered anything, then, then that, that comes up as a, as a missed hash. But there's a problem here, which is that these type of hashes really don't work for the way video is used and video is produced. Uh, you can imagine a scenario where you're, you're a news broadcaster and you're, you're out there filming an event. Uh, you're, you're filming you know, maybe 10 hours of footage. And you, you take in you know, maybe 10, 10 shots of B-roll, four or five shots of A-roll, a few pieces to camera. And you combine, them all that, uh, combine all that into your final file. You distribute that on your online platform, or you upload it to social media. If, if someone hashes what you uploaded and hashes the original sort of rushes that you created, those are never going to match. So what can we do? What's a smarter way that we can do that? Uh, well, if we have a look at the structure of video files, and here I took an existing file I had and put it into MKV to XML just so we can sort of visualize it. I'll buy a drink to anyone who can tell me what codec that is from the preamble. Um, we can look at those blocks of data. Uh, well, we know that the, you know, these video files are arranged in blocks. Uh, so we've got one block for each frame in, in most video formats and a, a block for each packet of audio. And we can apply a hash function on each one of those. So now we have a hash per frame and a hash per, per audio packet. That's a lot of hashes. If we're talking about hours of content, that's millions of hashes. Um, and that's not something we're, we're you know, going to want to store on something like the blockchain. Uh, it's going to be a, a very expensive operation. So what can we do? Uh, why can't, could we create a hash per minute or a hash per second, say? Well, we can look at some other sort of hash construction techniques that uh, those of you who may be familiar with how the blockchain works, just to take it as an example, um, there's this idea of Merkle trees. You can combine hashes into, you know, you take two hashes, combine them together, apply the hash on that, and you can create these trees of hashes. Uh, and that works really well for that application because if you change one of the hashes in the leaf nodes, that propagates up, but the other hashes stay the same. And so you can say, oh, okay, this is where it changed. But for video, that's not going to work that well because what you're doing with video, you're not changing a a value. You're removing content, you're you know, splicing con content in, adding stuff at the end, bringing in other clips. So here, like, you know, in my example, we're, we're removing one of the hashes, adding, uh, sorry, removing some of the content on one side, adding some content on the other. And now the alignment 
of this type of hashing is completely changed. So, so the entire tree is invalidated. It's, it's pretty much useless for us now. So what's another approach? How can we do hashes of hashes in a way that survives the way, the specific way that video tends to be edited and used? So this is the idea that we came up with, uh, which is, hey, let's apply a hash function to every, every frame, but then apply a modulus function on the, on the value of the hash. So say you do uh, a mod 30 on each hash, you know that, you know, because something like SHA-256 has a normal distribution of hash values. So if you're doing mod 30 on, on that, you know that on average you will get a value of zero as an output to the function every 30 frames. So now you've got one, you've got a hash, uh, or rather you've got a, a zero value for every second on average. As I say, it's a normal, normal distribution, so you'll, you'll sometimes get uh, the zero value more frequently. You'll get it every, every 10 frames maybe once, and you get it every 40 frames. Occasionally, it'll be a nice bell curve with 30 right down the middle. So you can expect, on average, to get a, hash, uh, a zero value every, every second in that particular case. Or you could do much more than mod 30 and, and do it every minute if you wanted to. And then you use that value. You, you know which hashes have, have a value zero, and you use that as a boundary to do your hash of hashes. So instead of a Merkle tree, you, you're taking all of these, these hashes of, of that particular span, and you're applying another hash function, and now you've got a hash of hash that's invariant to trimming, splicing, anything else. If you add stuff at the beginning or at the end of that region, that region's not going to change. So what, what does that look like? Coming back to the original uh, or the, the video, the Jordan Peele, uh, Barack Obama fake. We use this algorithm on that video to see what it might look like. And uh, we, we highlighted when the hashes don't match anymore uh, by having an orange box. I think there's, on average, one hash per frame, uh, sorry, per second on, on this one. So I don't know if you, you noticed the, the, the switch between the real video and, and the deep fake, and then the you know, we got the border showing, showing that, illustrating that so that we can have that information. So yeah, deterministic invariant time windows. They're great. I mean, I may be biased. This, this, one, this was my idea, so yeah. I like it. Uh, so how, how would that look like in, in practice? Uh, so some of you may be familiar with uh, something that happened one of the six months ago, uh, where Jim Acosta, well, there's a video of the journalist, Jim Acosta, who looked like he was karate chopping a White House intern. And there was a huge debate or discussion around, around this footage. Um, people asking, OK, has, has someone faked this content? Uh, is, it, is it authentic? And if we had something like this, then we would have known. Uh, so how would that have worked? Say you record on your camera, you generate the hashes as you're recording. So we're getting as close to the glass as possible. We can sign the hashes with a cryptographic key, uh, a camera key, uh, store the hashes in, in the blockchain. And then once you go back to, back to your news desk and you're ingesting all of that, that footage, you're editing, editing those recordings, uh, you, you create a final file. You can store the, uh, the reference to, to the original hashes in, in the metadata of that file and then publish to your platform, you know, maybe to social media, maybe to your own internal video sharing. Uh, system, and then that platform can retrieve the hashes from the blockchain, validate the signature of, of that hash, uh, rehash the, the video that, that it has access to, this heavily edited video, and then validate the portions of it that match the original recording. So this is, this is about you know, giving a green tick saying this is authentic, and it's not, it's not just about saying, oh, this video came from the person that claimed to come from but it's validating it right from the source, saying this is what the camera recorded. So nobody in that chain could have, could have interfered with it. So what should, we, what should we do? Where do we go from here? So I think there's three things that we as a community could, could start doing. Because as I said, you know, these, we're at that tipping point where it's just around the corner that we're going to get an explosion of, of this kind of technology. And so there's three things I think we, we should do as a community, which is 
when we're building new platforms, new, new uh, hardware, new software, new encoders, whatever it may be, think about should this be a good place? Is this where I can bring in some detection, some fake video detection, and get ahead of this problem? Uh, the other thing we can do is let's start sharing knowledge about the known deep fakes that we've come across. You know, there's already this approach, this framework for sharing objectional material, sharing knowledge about objectional material. Let's apply that to deep fakes. And the third thing is let's work together to find sort of a standard, a common framework for authentication of video. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're throwing our hat in the ring with, with one of the, you know, this idea. Uh, maybe, maybe it's not the right idea. I don't know. Uh, but now's the time for us to, to start chatting about it. Because, you know, the press is chatting about it a lot. But we should be chatting about it. You know, we're, you know, look, look around you. We're, we're in a room full of, you know, 750 engineers building the future of video, building the future of the future encoders, the future platforms, the, the, you know, building, building our future in video. If we're not going to be the ones to solve it, then who is? Thank you.